my goal today is to give you some ideas about how to get published in academic journals. And it's not that difficult if you just follow the process. So I'm going to try to do these three things today. Describe the process, enhance your ability to use academic writing, and to help you get published in academic journals. That's my goal for the end of today. And please feel free to ask any questions along the way. And you may want to make sure that your mics are muted right now. But the basic purpose of academic writing of any kind is to transmit ideas as efficiently and economically as possible. Not to sound smart or to show how much you know, but it's to get those ideas out there. Understanding that enables everything. It is a process, meaning it's a systematic series of actions or steps that lead to an end. And if you follow the steps, it will be easy and you will get published. You will have a finished academic product. Follow the process. The result, the written product is a result of the process. So you have to trust the process. And again, the focus is to get a written product out there to get it published. So as professors, we get paid to be curious, to find out about things, to know about stuff. And academic writing is being curious about stuff, finding the answers, and teaching. Writing is a form of teaching. We are teaching our audience. And academic writing, the goal is not to try to sound smart, but is to use concise, objective, academic language, no personal pronouns. We should not see the writer, we should see the ideas. And we should use as few words as possible. Good academic writing is not complicated. Good academic writing is easy to read. It's easy to make things complicated. It's hard to write things as simply as possible. Short sentences are wonderful. Our goal is to understand. The act of writing and teaching, these are mutually reinforcing. One supports the other. I write many articles based on what I'm teaching. I need more information. I go get more information. And that becomes the basis for an article. As well, every article that I write finds its way into the classroom. And this is why writing is so important in higher education. The act of writing invites us to explore the latest research, the latest academic work. As professors, we give, people shouldn't listen to us if we don't write, because writing shows that we have read the latest information of the latest research. So writing invites us to examine the latest research and academic work on our subject area. We move sometimes from teaching to writing. We're preparing a class on a subject. Sometimes we have to get more information. We do a review of literature and we find out this would be a great article. So as we're preparing our classes, as we are preparing our lectures, 
we find out about what needs to be written. And from our teaching, from our preparation, these are often the basis of good articles. And the nice thing about teaching is that we have a good sense of audience. We are teaching, we have our audience in front of us. So we're writing, teaching to our students, but we're writing and teaching to an audience of teachers or a real audience. So we move from teaching to writing. We also move from writing to teaching. Everything I have written has found its way into my classroom in some form or another. And I write mostly application, how-to articles. I am a scholar, not necessarily a researcher, but I look at what others have done, a secondary research. A researcher takes a very deep look at something specific. A scholar takes a wide look at that same thing. Both secondary research and primary research, one is not more important than the other. So I have gotten made, I have really learned to write by writing towards a teaching audience. What do teachers need to know? And there are a lot of journals out there looking for these how-to application types of articles. So as a writer, we get information, we read our journal articles, we synthesize that, and then we teach our audience through our writing. So here is the super secret writing process, and we're going to go through each step. But research means gathering data, looking at journal articles. The pre-draft is organizing our information. The draft is our first attempt to get it on the page. Revision is to review or see again and again. Editing, looking for grammar and spelling errors, and then sharing. These are the steps. If you follow these steps, you will get your stuff published. Now, these steps are recursive, not linear. Yes, they're in a nice one, two, three, four, five, six order here, but steps one through four. <laughs> Is, is somebody asking a question? Is somebody needing to... There we go. All right. Someone forgot to mute. Mute. All right. These four steps are recursive. Because as I'm writing, I sometimes need to gather more data. I need to draft and know that these steps are recursive and not linear. So let's look at step one. Writing always works best if you start with a question. This makes the search much easier. For example, how can we best develop reading fluency? That allows me to be much more efficient as I look for journal articles, as I look for data, and that's where I get my data from peer-reviewed journal articles. Step one, research to gather data. And uh, we are looking for journal articles. That is the best type of data, peer-reviewed academic journals. That is the best source of data to use. So we start with a question, then we began to gather data from as many sources as we can find. Oftentimes, if I get one good journal article, and here is a good journal article, 
it's kind of like being a detective that you then go to the reference section of that article and you find other articles. So as I'm conducting a review of the literature, I look to see what has been cited and that helps me find more good information. And of course, having access to academic journals is key to writing, to publishing, to having some sort of database. I read critically, taking notes. And as I'll say, there is no shortcut here. You must read critically, making decisions, recording only that which is related to your question. My question was related to reading fluency. As I'm reading, I only record that information which is related to my question. So from some sources, I'll have a lot of notes. Other sources, a very few notes, but we use some strategy. As we're taking notes, we use, I use a short abbreviated sentence so I can see the idea just to hold the idea so I can easily see the idea. I have the citation on top and then I'm using these short abbreviated just so I can quickly see it and see the idea. This is the basis of our articles. This is the basis. Having a cohesive body of knowledge is important. You have to write about something. It makes it easier the more information that you have on an article, on a topic you're writing about. The more articles you can read and take notes on, it makes it much easier to write. And as I sometimes tell my students, there's no shortcuts. Shortcuts always end up being long cuts. So this first step of gathering data, of reading articles and taking notes is essential. And that ensures that we know about what we're talking. Because believe me, the peer reviewers if you don't know what you're talking about, they will tell you. And listen, I'm getting ahead of myself, but you want to listen to the reviewers. When you send an article out for publication, they can sometimes be very brutal, but you always learn by listening to your reviewers. We want to find and use credible course, uh, sources. And again, starting with that clearly defined topic or question speeds up the reading process because you're reading just to focus on your question. So having that clearly defined up front greatly speeds up the whole process. We use only peer-reviewed academic journals, and as long as it's peer-reviewed, it's fine. Some of it may be research, some of it may be secondary research or theoretical articles. That's fine, but we use peer-reviewed research, and it can be older research. There are some very relevant studies in the 80s and 90s that are still good today. There are seminal studies, so just because it's old doesn't mean we can't use it. But of course, the latest research is better than the oldest, but don't be afraid to use some old sources. There are great sources. This is a mistake the general public sometimes make, 
data is different from research. Research is not research unless and until it has been published in a peer-reviewed academic journal. And that is what we use. That is the source. That is the that that is the basis of our academic work. It's that peer review. Instead of peer review will check to make sure that your methodology is okay, that you're being objective. You can make data say almost anything, but you can't make research say anything you want. So it's that peer review that is essential in our field, in being in the academy. Peer review process is essential. There are some reports that you can use, but use with caution. Government reports are okay as long as it's not the only source. Peer reviewed academic journals is probably the best because it's the latest. Government reports, there are some that you can use. Absolutely. And you can use some textbooks, but with caution again, just because it's written in a book doesn't mean it's true. But you want to look for well-known authors in academic publishers. And the thing about a book, it usually takes one and a half to two years for a book to get from my head and published. Whereas an article can get out there in two to, to four months. So academic articles and journals are tend to be a little bit more relevant and a little bit newer. But you can use textbooks as well. Step two is the pre-draft, what you do before you get your draft. And I recommend that you print out your notes in 10-point font using single-sided text. This allows me to spread my ideas out on the paper, out on the table, and see all my ideas. 10-point font. And again, I have my headings up there and 10-point font using short, abbreviated sentences. Remember, the process is recursive, not linear. Citations on the top, short, abbreviated sentences. Some articles, I'll get a lot of notes, some just a few based on having that question, that research question, very important. You don't have to record all the information in an article. As I see them spread out in front of me, I began to look for groups of things in all the articles. It's inductive analysis, inducing order on the group. Then I began to move similar ideas into groups. For example, in my research, a lot of articles said this, one of the best predictors of later reading comprehension is vocabulary. And I used some system to document that this author said that. So if I have a number of authors saying the same thing, I would just put their initials or their designation here as well. When I then make my statement, I don't have to look it up. I can cite all of these right here. But I'm using some system, and you find your own, but to move ideas into groups, and to remember where those ideas came from. This represents Lane Allen 2010. So as I'm writing, I can easily cite that. This is why it's important to have those notes, 10-point font. 
I use lots of headings and subheadings so I can see the structure of what I'm writing. And it's okay to overuse headings because you can always take them away. It's very difficult to read a large blob of text without any headings at all. This allows me to see the structure as I'm writing, but also allows the reader to see the structure as they're reading. So err on the side of using more headings and subheadings rather than fewer. And as I'm writing, I'm old, I got kind of bad eyes, I always use colors to highlight the levels of headings. First heading, level one, level two, level three heading. This allows me to see the, the levels easily as I'm writing. And I use the same colors every time. Step three. The first draft, the draft. An analogy is like this. This is your first attempt to get the ideas on paper. It's like a potter taking a blob of clay and throwing it on the potter's wheel. This is your first attempt. You're getting a blob of clay. You have to be willing to write badly. Most papers get stuck here because people are trying to get it just right the first time. If you do this, you'll get nothing out there. Get it on the paper. Allow yourself to write garbage. It's important to write badly. You'll go back and you'll see where things need to be moved later on. The draft, the first attempt. First attempt of my articles and chapters are horrible, but I know that they'll be cleaned up as I go along. Later, you're going to begin shaping that pot, but you got to get the clay on the wheel first. You cannot write well if you're not first willing to write poorly. Get those ideas on the paper. The thing about the draft is you want to get those ideas on the page without thinking about them. This frees up your unconscious to begin to make associations. I believe that we do a lot of writing with our unconscious mind. If we're thinking on this idea, we're less able to make connections. If we just get the ideas on the paper, our unconscious mind begins to make associations and connections. And here's two more tips I have related to your unconscious mind. When I'm working on an article, touch your article every day, even if it's for five minutes, because this keeps your unconscious mind engaged, percolating on these ideas. And even when you think you're not writing, your unconscious mind is still making these connections. Some of my best writing ideas come not at the computer, but when I'm out doing something else, it will suddenly, the whole thing, I'll see it clearly. Writing with your unconscious mind. Step four. Revision. Revision, seen again and again and again and again. This is the heart of the writing process, the revision. This is where you should spend the most time. It is common for me to revise 20, 25 times at least. And remember, the steps are recursive. Sometimes as I'm revising, I need to go back and get more information. Maybe do another pre-draft, outline, or draft. So you do a lot of recursive steps here. We do not edit until we're done revising. 
this is like you are beginning to shape the clay on the pot. Recursive steps. One, two, three, four, but I'm going all back and forth. And that's okay. I'm beginning to shape the pot. I'm pulling things away. I'm adding more clay. Now, as I revise, I go from whole to part to whole. Meaning the whole is, I get the draft on the paper. That's the whole. Then I go part. Sentence by sentence, I look at just one sentence. What words don't need to be there? Does it say exactly what I want it to say? Then I do the second sentence until I have that whole paragraph. Then I look at that paragraph and say, what doesn't need to be there? Is it written as simply as possible? Then I repeat going to the next paragraph. What you don't put in an article is just as important as what you do put in an article. So I really pull out everything that doesn't need to be there. And here's a trick I use. When I'm done with a paragraph, I use the text to speech function. I have the computer play it back to me so I can hear it. And I always catch things as I'm listening to my writing being read back to me. That's whole to part. And when I get through the whole thing, then I can see it as a whole again and begin to make further revisions. But that uh, text to speech function I found is very important. And as I said, when you're working on an article, touch it every day to keep your unconscious mind engaged. Now, I would recommend that you have a specific writing time. My colleague David Komori says he writes at night when all his kids are in bed. I write the first thing in the morning. That's what I do every morning. I show up and I'll write from five minutes to four hours, depending on how much time I have but I need that thinking space. You know, we need these three and four hour blocks of time. But touch it every day to keep your unconscious mind engaged. So here's a strategy that you can use your colleagues to help you. This is the revising process, how you work. It's called the circle read. If you have a group that are uh, writers that want to help each other that you all bring a piece of paper you all bring a revision a draft that you're working on each person uh, the group reads the paper for the first time in that group you trade papers and you write your response right on the paper what ideas are going through your head as you read this paper when you're finished writing on that paper, you trade with another. And you can usually do three or four papers in 45 minutes. And when you're done, the author gets that paper back with all these comments on it, and the paper comes alive. The circle read gives you a sense of how your paper is playing in the audience of your readers. So you all bring a draft of what you're working on, I recommend you don't put your names on it. You trade papers. You write directly on the paper. When you're done, you hold it up. You trade with another person. You try to get through three or four papers. At the end of an hour or however long you stop, the author gets his or her paper back, and you have all these great ideas and responses. So you can see what doesn't make sense. What's interesting? What needs to be included or taken away? That's one way to work in a writing group. The other is called a deep read. If you have a group of writers working together, anywhere from five to 10, you send copies to each person in the group. 
and you want to give them at least two days to look at that paper. And you write on that paper, and each member comes prepared to give feedback on that paper, written and verbal comments. And you spend 10 to 15 minutes on each paper and use a timer so the first person doesn't take up too much time. So you give copies of your paper to everyone in the group. They take a day or two to read through, write their comments, come back, and each member is prepared to give feedback, either written or oral or both. You can do maybe three papers at a time or however you choose to do it, but there's two ways to do it. And this is the debrief. The circle where you show up, people read for the first time there, or the debrief where you prepare yourself before the group. Step five. This is where you began to look at spelling and grammar, not before. The writing groups are an effective way to get feedback and to develop uh, skills, all right, and to catch errors. But we all miss errors because we get too close to our writing. So it's always good to have someone look at your paper and look for these errors. What happens, by the way, when people try to edit during steps one, two, three, or four, that's what gunks up the writing process. If you're trying to edit too soon, if you're trying to get it just right, you're not going to get anything done. And then step six, we've edited, is to get that stuff out there, is to find a journal for it to publish, to get it out there. And there's a whole bunch of uh, journals out there that you can use. And again, it doesn't have to be a high prestige journal. The goal is to get it published, peer review. Once it's out there, people can begin to use and cite it. And it's a lot like playing a detective. Find the type of journal that you like to read or that publishes your article. Always then go to that site and get a sense of the submission guidelines for that journal. Read them carefully and send it out. That's the key. So some of just some basics. As you're writing, you take that objective academic stance. You want to write just the facts. You want to trust the reader to come to a conclusion. And as a writer, they should not see you. They should see only the ideas. So you're striving for that objective academic stance. We don't want to see you, we want to see the ideas that you're writing on. Including too much information gets in the way. Only include what is necessary. And I said this before, what you don't include is just as important as what you do include. And nothing sounds quite so silly as someone trying to sound smart. It's okay to use simple words and simple sentences. Long rambling sentences are hard to read and understand. Our goal is to go to our readers. We don't use useless objectives, adjectives. Too many in, uh, adjectives creates this subjectivity and diminishes our credibility. We become more credible when we are not seen, when they just see our ideas. And we do not use contractions in our professional writing. All right, at this point, those are just some overviews. I am going to open it up for questions.